Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. As always, you can find us on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and you can engage with our experts on Vimeo using the chat box. We'd also love it if you would sign up for our latest news at aerospace.org slash policy. Today's episode is on Inside Digital Engineering in the U.S. Air Force. Digital engineering may be the way forward to the military becoming more agile in fielding and maintaining new space systems. This week, Rosalind Lewis from Aerospace talks to Deputy Assistant Secretary Kristen Baldwin and Major General Kimberly Kreider about the future of digital engineering for the DOD, the Air Force, and the Space Force. Rosalind Lewis is General Manager of the Special Programs Division at the Aerospace Corporation. She has experience in leading architecture development, ground and space acquisition decision-making, and risk analysis. Air Force Major General Kimberly Kreider is Acting U.S. Space Force Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. In her role, she is responsible for leveraging innovation and rapid acquisition technologies for the U.S. Space Force. Kristen Baldwin is Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Science, Technology, and Engineering. She manages the Air Force's science and technology programs and developmental prototyping and experimentation. Welcome everyone and over to Rosalind to get us started. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'd also like to thank our guests today. First, we have Major General Kim Kreider. Thank you, Rosalind. It really is a pleasure to be here today. And we also have Ms. Kristen Baldwin. Roz, it's great to see you, and it's also terrific to be able to address the, the team at Aerospace again. It's great having you both here. So let's just dive right into this, and let's start by discussing the latest Air Force digital engineering memo and how it lends to responsiveness, integration of forces, and as well as commercial and cost considerations. Ms. Baldwin, can we start with you on this one? Certainly. Uh, the memorandum that AQ signed out is a follow-on to last fall's publication of uh, Department of the Air Force vision and guidance um, on the digital trinity. Uh, Dr. Roper published these last fall and in, in a, and he mentioned in those documents the uh, forthcoming digital building code. Uh, so what this is really is a living set of standards and guidance that we will continue to update as we proceed through our digital transformation. One of the best things I think that Dr. Roper did was to identify our program executive offices and our programs as the leads for this transformation. Uh, this really allows us to focus on the tactical implementation and the real experiences and the opportunities to embark on this digital journey. Um, so we are, uh, their experiences are directly shaping guidance like what AQ has now published um, in this, in this uh, memorandum. What the memo also does is it provides new guidance on e-program designations. Uh, our Air Force and Space Force are employing uh, three elements of this digital trinity, uh, open systems architecture, agile software practices, and digital engineering. And so the memorandum highlights how um, programs can request to be designated as an e-program um, if, if they are embracing the full, uh, all three full elements of that digital trinity. 
And so the SAE, or Ms. Costello in this case right now, will um, make a determination of whether a program would be would receive this E designation um, based on how closely the program is um, employing this um, digital building code that the outline that the memorandum outlines, as well as the degree to which uh, the program is meeting the kind of the, the criteria in the scorecard that is that is laid out as well in the memo. Um, in in the actual memo, there's there's you'll notice that there is a, a section on each of the three elements of the Trinity, and um, and what we provide there is um, expectations or good starting practices um, for for fully um, um, implementing starting the journey towards implementing this transition. Uh, or transformation. And then it also provides very specific pointers to additional guidance, tools, um, and, um, and additional, you know, questions and answers. So for example, the uh, digital campaign guide will be, um, has a pointer in there, uh, a number of pointers. And this is a fantastic resource that is continuously updated with um, the feedback and with additional tools and techniques that we are, we are developing along this journey. And um, we also have um, pointers to a fantastic website that's main, maintained by our chief software officer. And um, in addition to training and standards, um, he's got on there a very useful primer um, that um, programs can step through uh, that provides useful questions and answers and, and sort of just outlines the, the step towards um, taking uh, uh, on the um, the agile software practices and and incorporating those practices into into programs. Thank you, Ms. Baldwin. A very thorough definition and explanation of the memo. General Kreider, can you speak to what this means from the Air Force perspective? And I heard the terms becoming an E program. Sounds very interesting. Well, I can speak to it in what it terms it means from a Space Force perspective. Um, so the Space Force is, is really excited about this memo and on all of the aspects that it lays out with regards to the digital trinity, uh, open systems, design, uh, agile, and digital engineering are foundational to, to everything that we're doing in the Space Force. Uh, as a new service, we are leaning in hard on new ways to deliver capability to our warfighting operations uh, faster uh, and with much more data uh, infused into what those systems can do. So data-driven capabilities built from the start uh, with data as a core component, not only of what is delivered, uh, but how we deliver it. Uh, so this whole idea of building out systems as e-programs uh, in an e-program context, uh, where you can rapidly develop and deploy uh, capabilities you can build digital twins based on digital models uh, up front so that you can really do uh, a, a variety of cost trades or capability trades, work really closely with your industry partner on what those future solutions really need to look like as they deliver digital twins into the environment. And you can really have a sense of how this capability uh, is going to work. Uh, and then from a modular perspective, you can plug in, play, you know, different uh, types of uh, components and features that you can iterate very quickly over time, which is in that agile context. These things really do go together, right? An entire digital environment where you can uh, really uh, model out the capability, infuse it with live data, uh, plug and play different feature options uh, in a modular kind of open system concept and rapidly iterate capabilities as you're building it out and delivering a digital artifact uh, with a physical artifact uh, into operations that then makes it much more effective and easier to sustain. This is really critical from a Space Force perspective, as you can imagine, because once we launch something uh, into space, it is a lot harder uh, to make changes and to modify uh, and to make adjustments as we go. Uh, we don't land our satellites every day. Uh, they stay up there on orbit for years on end. So we wanna make sure we've really thought through the design and that we can rapidly uh, adjust changes on some of the core components of those satellite systems so that we can 
have a lot of reuse uh, and bring down the overall total cost of ownership of those capabilities and reuse certain uh, aspects of the satellite system across all of our different mission areas it gives us a lot more flexibility uh, and agility in what we do. We're not out there in the space domain with those assets. We don't have you know humans in space uh, actively integrating with those assets. So we have to rely on the digital uh, artifacts and the digital twin uh, and the whole process of building this uh, rapid modu modular agile capability is critical uh, to our ability to ensure that the capabilities that we're putting uh, on orbit and that we're integrating into our terrestrial environments and connecting to other domain capabilities uh, meet the needs that we have today and can continue to evolve into the future. Thank you. So General Carter, you spoke quite a bit about what it means for our programs to become space programs, Space Force to become e-programs. Digging into that a little bit more, agile commercial companies have been working to do more of their decision-making and program management directly in the digital environment. How far do you think the DOD, the Air Force, and the Space Force can go into adopting this kind of approach? Oh, I think we can go. Uh, we can go all in on this. Uh, there is so much opportunity as we really start to establish the environment that we need uh, to be able to think through how we're going to uh, develop these capabilities uh, in a digital way. And it really starts, you know, way to the left of actually starting to build out uh, a capability set digitally. Uh, we start from the perspective of thinking about our future force design and building the model associated with what kind of capabilities we think we're going to need you know, 10, 20, 30 years out uh, based on where we see uh, the future environment uh, headed, where we see threats in the environment, how we see the domain evolving. So to model all of that and to model the kinds of capabilities that we think we're going to need uh, is what we call force design. And that's really the beginning of where we think we need to go. Now, Modern agile companies are doing this for themselves as well as they think about you know, the, the marketplace and the competition that they're facing. There, there are all kinds of modeling that they do. We're, we're looking to do the same sort of thing, but then tying that in a digital environment so that these future force design concepts uh, we can then use as a basis for uh, prioritizing the capabilities that we think we're going to need and coordinating on what those capabilities are with our other service partners. Um, you know, many of the capabilities that we develop have joint uh, requirements and implications for interoperability associated with them. So we've got to coordinate uh, all of that work. And again, to do that digitally makes it go a lot faster, ensures that our decision-making is uh, uh, recorded throughout, uh, you know, and those digital models are then much easier to understand and make adjustments around. Again following industry's lead on some of the interesting things that they've done to get capabilities developed very quickly and, and into market much faster. We're working towards the same thing, really well thought out uh, future design, what those concepts should be, how we get those capabilities coordinated on, and then right into uh, design and development efforts that we do in partnership with our industry partners uh, in environments where we can uh, compare and contrast on different approaches and different features and different cost capability trades in evolving threat environments so that when industry delivers a digital twin to us, we can run it against those early force design models and see how this capability would actually perform. We see industry doing this uh, and the whole concept of rapid agile, uh, agile software development, iterating as we go, uh, putting capability into the hands of operators early and often so that you get that direct operator feedback. Here again, the digital model allows for that much more flexibility for operator involvement with the kinds of uh, systems that we're talking about so that operators can get a sense of how this is going to work, how this is going to integrate with their current operations or with their current training, their current modes of uh, command and control for those capabilities and tie into other uh, ground and space-based uh, network systems and, and the ease of integration. All of those things uh, are much more effectively worked out in this digital arena. Again, we see industry uh, doing this uh, and evaluating uh, their capabilities to do this across a variety of sectors. Uh, and so we think that going all in on this is certainly 
We're going to give us uh, the same kind of value uh, out of the effort, out of the investment that many, many industry uh, partners in a variety of industry sectors have done. Uh, this, I think, is relatively new to the space industry, quite frankly. Uh, but certainly, if you look across uh, transportation uh, writ large in the commercial world, uh, manufacturing writ large in the commercial world, you see more and more of this uh, digital, the use of these kinds of digital capabilities and the application of rapid agile software development uh, and open systems design uh, having been critical uh, to their increased productivity, bringing costs down uh, and getting capability into market faster. That's how industries compete. We're in a competitive environment. Uh, with a very strong uh, competitive set of adversaries. Uh, we need to be able to move fast. We need to have much more flexibility and we need to bring our overall cost of ownership down. Thank you. Ms. Baldwin, what about you? What's different about this uh, effort? What's different from the policy level and why is it necessary to have this from a high level as a policy and how do we get there? You know, Kim really hit it at the in her last statement, uh, and that's really where I want to start off. We can't afford not to change our traditional approaches to um, capability, uh, concept generation, design analysis, and and most of all, uh, delivery in an in an affordable fashion. We've uh, we are in an absolute competition uh, with peer competitors peer nations, and um, we have to be able to not only just respond, but, you know, get ahead and surprise um, and uh, deliver capability and, and, um, and change at a speed of relevance. Um, with regard to can we do this, I would say with the, um, the knowledge that we're gaining from our industry counterparts um, and who are demonstrating the benefits and the, and the success capability from the, from the types of tools that make up the digital trinity, whether it be open standards, open architectures, agile practices uh, that, that embed in the development environment security or or other um, other other certified characteristics that that help um, create consistency and an ability to to move faster as we as we develop, um, and then finally just the the modeling and analysis capability that the digital thread um, and an and an authoritative source of truth about a system that grows over time as we as we start off in in conceptual phases iterating thousands and thousands of, of designs um, or, or options uh, to achieve an optimal solution, and then growing that uh, throughout the life cycle, learning and iterating and get, obtaining feedback, whether it be from operational users or feedback from our, our functional um, leaders who, who provide uh, surety and and um, cyber security and airworthiness and 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 ensure that that our that our um, our performance thresholds and requirements are being met and tested in um, that system model grows all throughout that entire time and um, and creates a, a true opportunity for streamlined um, earlier uh, streamlined um, processes and practices shared data that that identifies um, issues or 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 um, or challenges um, way ahead of, of finding them after we've built hardware and prototypes and we're in the, the phase of test. So all of these successes that have been demonstrated by industry are things that we are seeing that we can capitalize on and and that is embodied in the leadership across the department, um, actually across the Department of Defense and with our with our Department of, of uh, the Air Force leadership um, and and with our other service counterparts. That's why I think that um, we definitely can can go far and, uh, and adopt these these um, these business and, and uh, cultural and workforce process changes. Um, some key, uh, let's talk about how we roll this out though. So in general, our guidance um, that we're issuing is that all new programs have the real opportunity to just start off as 
as digital, just kind of being born digital. Now we have a lot of programs, as you know, that are that are currently in development, and then a whole lot of programs that are legacy as well. And so for these programs, they'll need to do a an assessment, and and we lay out some uh, some guidance, and we're collecting some experiences on how programs can actually assess. Um, the the um, where it makes sense to make change and adopt some of the digital practices into their programs now where they will be most benefit because it can be quite hard to renegotiate contracts of course right and that can be costly as well so it's this it's this balance and this assessment where we're going to get the most return for the change some key factors that play into um, a program's assessment is where where do we see the, um, the the elements of a system that are uh, we see as being most uh, required to be flexible or most most subject to change, and it's um, and then in those parts or those those components of the system down to what level. Uh, do we expect that change? And so those types of questions can help us make a have a um, a plan or an approach, start to outline approach for how a program that's already in development, already in operations, even can start to make some updates into their into their contracts and into their practices, into their requirements. Another um, another key driver of this change and um, and and program adoption is the um, is the data what data rights do we have what data rights do we have access to and um, um, you know uh, that that's that's a real uh, um, that will change from developer and suppliers and program type um, uh, you know and so that's a very unique um, instance that each program will have to have to make an assessment of. And then finally, another key driver uh, of the full adoption of Dr. Roper's vision um, of the digital trinity is where are we doing the development? Now, in many cases, and historically, I mean, over the past, you know, several maybe decades, you know, we've made choices about how we're going to just completely outsource the development. And then more recently, we've been talking about owning the technical baseline as an Air Force and as a Space Force and 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 taking on more of that engineering and that development internally. And as, you, as you've as you read uh, from the vision that has been described by the department, you know, we see the government owning the development environment. And we see that in a, in sort of um, you know in true real cases of digital pathfinders, where the the our suppliers and our own engineers are in the same common environment. Now, this is going to be something that exists. Maybe it's easier for that to exist in a brand new program. You know, to start it out. You know, negotiate that um, and how that's all going to be done for. Programs that are that are ongoing and, of course, legacy, we may not have that have that environment um, there ready. So that's another kind of key aspect of um, of rolling this out, of implementing, and the things that our programs right now are are um, working uh, working out. Um, at the same time that our programs are all making this decision, I, I don't want to leave you with any impression that this is all up to the programs. We, as a as an Air Force and and partnered with the Space Force collectively are, are um, uh, doing quite a lot to grow the capability, the infrastructure, the tools, the training um, in order to help um, provide those environments, to provide those, those, um, those uh, uh, particular uh, contract structures, if you will, that help to create those partnerships with uh, our, our supply chain and help them to be ready to do business with with uh, the government um, to break down some barriers. And um, uh, we are hopeful that over the next uh, years, we already have started um, provisioning a sort of a digital environment as a service to multiple PMs. We want to be able to grow that capability over time. We're populating that capability with common tools. Um, as well as uh, reference architectures that help um, enable these programs to, to think about where do I make that choice of 
What do I want to, um, you know, what data rights might I need to might I need to buy? What interfaces do I need to make sure are open? What are the open standards that I'm going to implement as part of my design? And so all of these types of tools and techniques and services um, are start are growing as as we embark on this journey um, as as functional providers of this of this digital transformation. Wow. Thank you, Ms. Baldwin. There was a lot of information in that, particularly as it applies to programs that are in an early phase or maybe mid phase. Um, also some very practical things about what industry is doing and how we can possibly learn those lessons. So I'm gonna ask General Kreider to speak for just a few moments about what can we learn? What can the Space Force learn from some of the other Pathfinder programs for digital engineering and what should the Space Force personnel know about how that's gone? Uh, are, th are, are there good lessons and lessons that we can take from good and, and challenging experiences that they could bring into this for their own development and planning? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I'm just really excited about everything that Ms. Baldwin talked about. Uh, because those kinds of services and capabilities that are coming out at the department level, um, we're all going to benefit from uh, and, and be able to leverage. And I think we're all contributing to it as well, you know, within the Space Force and also within the Air Force. Um, a variety of programs uh, are already heading down the path uh, and, and being and acting as the Pathfinder programs, you know, to really uh, drive this out. Uh, so that others can, can learn and to follow. We've learned a lot from our Air Force counterparts, uh, the GBSD program in particular, uh, and then within the Space Force, within our SATCOM portfolio, uh, we have a few Pathfinder programs that are uh, really the ones that are helping us kind of think through this and how this is really going to work and, and putting some of those kinds of practices that Ms. Baldwin talked about and, and the tools that she talked about really uh, at work so that we can work through this and, and we can partner uh, internally and externally with our with our uh, our vendors and our supply chain. So within the uh, Space Force portfolio, uh, we've got the Protected Anti-Jam SATCOM program, very much uh, a pathfinder, been going after this actually for quite some time, thinking through how you would use uh, digital tools and capabilities to think through those new design uh, solutions and more rapidly uh, and with more agility, uh, provide new capabilities uh, to the warfighters. Within that portfolio as well, we have something called the satellite bus uh, program. Uh, and what that does is it really gives us the, the opportunity to get on that path towards uh, an e-program and an e-series uh, of programs so that we are taking a very specific uh, aspect of a satellite system the bus of the satellite uh, and thinking through how that bus needs to be designed and developed uh, for modularity uh, and the ability to uh, be able to evolve to support a variety of different payloads and a variety of, and meet a variety of different service needs uh, and doing that again within our SATCOM portfolio but collaborating uh, with across uh, other portfolios through our portfolio architect uh, so that we can really think about how do we get much more agility in the overall design uh, of our systems. Now, what are these Pathfinder programs uh, helping us learn? Well, we're learning a lot about how uh, the architecture needs to work, how you need to design for this up front, uh, how you need to plan ahead to think through the kinds of um, architecture that you require, uh, the kinds of modeling that you need, the kinds of modeling tools and how to string these tools together. Uh, in an open uh, and modular kind of way. So this open systems architecture design within our digital environment and how we uh, can integrate the tools and exchange data much more seamlessly across the environment has been a really important uh, learning aspect for this. That, in that informs the different standards that we need for these tools and we can then uh, coordinate and collaborate uh, with our outside tool provider vendors on how to ensure that we have uh, you know, a certain de you know, a degree of openness and uh, application programming interfaces associated with these tool sets that make them much more easier to, to use and to integrate for a variety of needs. Uh, the ability to 
uh, pull data in uh, to the environment from authoritative data sources uh, and ensure that uh, that data is accessible at multiple levels of security uh, is another important uh, aspect of what we're learning because as we build these capabilities out, we're building them uh, out to be able to support uh, data from a variety of different sensors uh, about a variety of different system capabilities that have to be able to uh, be deployed in, in different security environments. So uh, these Pathfinder programs are teaching us a lot, a lot about how do we do digital engineering in a multi-level secure cloud-based computing environment where we've got to be able to pull the data in. We've got to be able to uh, infuse those models with live authoritative data to really understand how those uh, capabilities are going to be able to perform in the operational environment. And we've got to do it uh, you know, with realistic security built in uh, throughout. So, so those are important features. Uh, working with the tools themselves and the whole process of how we need to develop uh, and train and educate our workforce to be able to work in this new mode. This is not the, the way that we've typically raised our program managers and our systems engineers to work and to operate and to collaborate. So that's all new. Uh, and we're learning about the kinds of things that we need to build into our training pipeline as we develop um, our acquisition experts and give them the opportunity to collaborate more closely with industry partners and with operational users uh, through this collaborative environment and to develop that iterative capability. All of those things uh, are coming out of the Pathfinder programs and they're all extremely valuable ways to inform uh, our policy, uh, our strategy, our, de our design of the system itself, the kinds of tools and capabilities that we need, uh, and our ability to be very effective as we build this out. So you both had very good observations about the Pathfinder, about lessons learned, but let me pull on something. I heard a little bit about Pathfinder programs and what we're learning from General Kreider. Ms. Baldwin, I also heard from you about the government actually owning the development environment and the tech baseline. What's the difference between the way we accomplish our programs, we execute our programs, work with industry in that context versus what we do now? And I'll open that one to, uh, I'll start with maybe with you with Ms. Baldwin, then I'll go to you, General Kreider. Yeah, I would, uh, I think that all of us are learning, each of the services are learning from all of these Pathfinder programs. We're learning, um, in fact, last uh, week, we just held a PEO workshop, a full day workshop where we shared some of our emerging guidance. Um, and, and we also had the opportunity for each of the PMs to do a or PEOs, excuse me, do a, a self-assessment on how they're employing um, the digital practices within their portfolio. And to get to your point, uh, Roz, um, what what is changing is the is 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 how we are partnering in the work to be done. We're not just, as I mentioned before, outsourcing it to a, um, a supply chain and then managing that work um, there. In, and that's the, the tremendous growth um, that, and change that's really, um, that, that um, as Kim mentioned, you know, training that the, and, and all of the activities that we're bringing forward is in terms of tools and infrastructure and um, environments that we're, we're generating. So that's where the change is, I would say. Um, it is it is being um, uh, having access to models and tools versus having uh, managing and requesting a, um, a doc a set of documents. Um, uh, another key change uh, just uh, is is that that that's a key change that impacts our entire acquisition business process activity. And so this is going to be a big, um, we've got to, we have to change the way that we communicate, the way that we request data. Um, right now we, we request data in terms of um, 
some of our some of our contractual elements ask for you know uh, in conformance with eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper. Um, we want to be able to request data in terms of the models, um, in terms of specific formats, and so and then we need to have our engineers be able to operate with that data and receive that data and evaluate that data. And so and so that's another um, you know just the acquisition process and environment. Um, transformation and accepting these new formats in these environments that are that are shared in some cases or, or just if, if you're not in a situation where you're operating inside the government stack bras like you mentioned at least what we want to be able to do is have the have have our be able to us to be able to communicate within the uh, data formats so send to us in, in terms of required data formats so that we can enter that data right into our environment, we can analyze that, and we can provide responses or feedback in, in, uh, in ways in which our supply chains can also keep that data um, going. We don't want to get into a situation where we're having to, um, you know, kind of re-enter it into different systems. What we want to do is have that have that easy exchange of data. Now I, I make it sound like easy. We have a long way to go. Um, and that's that's all of the the standards and the guidance and the and the um, and and quite frankly the exchange with industry. We're working along with industry. What we're doing here is we're adapting many of the practices that are already existing in the commercial marketplace. And so as we do that, we want to adopt industry best practices commercial practices and standards to the greatest extent possible. And then we want to embed those practices into the way that we do business in the DOD. And another thing that I think that we're learning uh, in some of the um, program experiences that we've been describing is not only how are we transforming from an acquisition process perspective, but from a engineering process. So think of the traditional ways that we used to do systems engineering technical reviews. For example, a, pr a preliminary design review, a critical design review. Our programs are experimenting now with doing those digitally. Um, so we're not just convening all of the experts on a program and having a sort of a, re a review by PowerPoint. We are, we are embedding um, ourselves in the model to understand and review the model and the behaviors of the model uh, as and, and using that behavior uh, and demonstrated characteristics as to inform the um, the PDR or the CDR. So this is this is all going to be um, uh, adapting our our processes and even our formal systems engineering um, expectations and the in and metrics of what does it mean to complete a design review? What does it mean to complete a particular point? In, in the life cycle and how do we measure that complete that completion with most effectiveness it's no longer going to be 90 percent of my my blueprints or my documents um, uh, completed it might be something like I've actually built a model and and have checked it out to that and verified that it meets all of the characteristics that I am um, that I am uh, modeling. Uh, towards from a performance perspective. So very exciting um, ways in which that we're learning uh, and that we've got to continue to move forward and adopt our, our technical and business practices. Thank you. General Kreider, the same question to you, the collaborative environment, we're learning things. Um, we will have a environment where the customer, the government, they work more tightly together. What's, what do you think are the key differences between the way we're executing our programs to deliver capabilities? What do you see as the key differences? Well, I think one of the things that Ms. Baldwin talked about early, uh, early on uh, to build upon some of her comments is this idea of the government owning the uh, development environment uh, and, and the tech baseline that goes along with that and making that available to industry and to programs throughout. Uh, this, is, this is a difference in how we're going about this. And what we mean by that is you know, we have become uh, much more 
attuned to the importance and the value of enterprise, uh, common enterprise services uh, and standards. We talked a little bit about standards uh, early on, but this idea of common enterprise services that we want all programs to be able to leverage uh, and use and industry partners uh, to be able to leverage and use in this uh, integrated uh, development environment. Um, so what we mean by that more specifically, uh, many, many of you out there have heard about Cloud One uh, and the government um, program to deliver uh, enterprise cloud services, uh, leveraging commercial industry uh, products and tool sets uh, and integrating that into a set of services that are secure and available and can be hosted uh, in on-prem and off-prem environments. Uh, and again, from a variety of different vendors. But having a, a government design team uh, with industry participation that, that builds out uh, and then provisions those uh, secure, uh, integrated cloud services uh, out to different programs uh, and different users. So that's cloud one. We also have uh, a lot of work that's gone on under the uh, leadership of the chief software officer for a platform uh, environment. We refer to as platform one, platform as a service. Uh, and those kinds of uh, commercially provided uh, open uh, tools and uh, capabilities that are integrated and secured uh, through the uh, team of folks that work on the platform one uh, architecture in partnership with programs and industry and what that really needs to look like. Uh, and then providing those platform one services uh, out to uh, the programs uh, as part of the integrated environment that we're going to do our digital engineering uh, development uh, on and deployment into production. So have a full up continuous integration, continuous deployment, what we uh, refer to as the CI-CD pipeline, uh, built out, deployed on Cloud One, uh, Platform One deployed on Cloud One uh, to provide that environment, that tech stack for continuous uh, development of models, uh, integration of models, and then infusion of data associated with those models. And that data is brought in from Data One. So an enterprise, uh, common enterprise set of services for hosting, storing, managing, securing, and protecting data and making that data available uh, into those uh, platform environments where those software development efforts are actively and agilely uh, being carried out uh, in the, uh, the cloud-based Cloud One environment. So Cloud One, Platform One, Data One, uh, all integrated, all government um, kind of led uh, effort to integrate and own that tech baseline uh, with industry partners and industry uh, tools and capabilities integrated through in, uh, working through how to leverage uh, open source uh, software throughout to the maximum extent uh, and avoiding the need for programs to build out that underlying infrastructure on their own uh, over and over again. Uh, we don't need to have programs building the underlying infrastructure, but leveraging uh, these kinds of enterprise common services and tool sets that are being wrung out at an enterprise level with participation from a community of internal and external stakeholders uh, to really ensure that, that these capabilities work the way that they need to and they can integrate uh, very effectively and they can be secured. Uh, and run it in the different environments where we need them. So all of that's very different. And it's in a really important part of this whole uh, e-program uh, and e-series approach. And within the Space Force, uh, we're leveraging all of that. In fact, because all of that has been uh, built out uh, in, in large measure uh, by the department and partnership with the Air Force, as we've come along in the Space Force and have looked to accelerate our efforts to get going in a digital engineering uh, environment and, and move out quickly with our Pathfinder programs, we have found that having those capabilities available to us and, and starting from that versus having to build all that out has saved us an immense amount of time uh, and allowed us to go much faster than we could have uh, had we had to start out you know, from, from uh, you know, ground zero. Uh, and now gives us a capability that we can uh, refine and evolve uh, and scale uh, and make available uh, in partnership with the department uh, out to our vendors and out to our other programs 
uh, at a much more rapid pace. Uh, so we get that enterprise scalability uh, right at the start that we can um, we can build upon. So we're really excited about that new approach. It is different. Uh, we typically let programs, you know, just sort of build everything from the ground up that they need. But again, it's costly uh, and it's not necessary in this kind of an environment that we're working towards. So we eliminate all those redundant costs. We can you know, have this underlying shared environment that we can all leverage uh, and advance together. And then we can allow the program offices to focus on what do they need for their specific programs? What models, what data, how to build that out very rapidly to, cut, to get the capabilities they need into the hands of the operators faster. Thank you. You both spoke about the benefits and what's going to be different in terms of infrastructure, in terms of processes, including acquisition processes, in terms of both the government being collaborative with industry. Uh, so given the level of investment necessary to benefit from digital engineering, not only in the tools, we talked about that just now, General Kreider, you spoke quite a bit about that. What about investment necessary in people? Or, and, and our culture? What changes in training and education are necessary for the workforce to embrace this new way of operating? And Ms. Baldwin, I'd like to start with you first. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, culture is, is key. Um, so this is a business process reengineering and culture shift, as well as a technical and experiential and training shift. I would say from a culture standpoint, our leadership is bought in and that is what drives that change um, and that mindset. Um, you see the, the the memorandum that we started talking about at the beginning of this of this show um, is one element of that leadership buy-in and direction. Um, I will tell you, um, these, these same leaders are following through. So when our programs are coming forward for decisions or reviews, uh, leadership is going to be asking questions and already is asking questions and, and asking for feedback. At the same time, our leadership is engaged, which is fantastic. Uh, they're, they're out there um, with the workforce, understanding what's going on, engaged, hearing the feedback, and really excited by all of the all of the strides that each of our programs, as well as our functional leaders, are are making. So I think that's one aspect of the of the people shift, right? Um, and then the second is the is the shift in training. Uh, whereas um, much of our traditional acquisition workforce training would come from uh, Defense Acquisition University, and they're still a part of it. Um, but the but the shift that's needed now in our training is to help our engineers and our our practitioners broadly be able to understand how to do business differently with the models, with the tools, with the with the data environments. Um, Kim and I have both mentioned, um, you know operating in in uh, you know in different infrastructure or environments as well as with different contracting instruments or with engineering models and so our training now is shifting towards helping our engineers and our functional leaders across the different career fields understand how to interact with these new um, data-based artifacts rather than maybe paper-based, if I simplify it. Um, uh, where will we get um, this training? In addition to DAU, um, can, where, where we can get sort of broad process um, and expectations training, we're going to different places. Um, Air Force Institute of Technology is starting to provide very detailed courses in uh, system modeling language, in some of the specific tools, we're also partnering with our service partners. Um, one of uh, one of the, one of the courses that we're offering to our Department of the Air Force practitioners is from the Navy um, and how they're doing their model-based systems engineering training. And then our FFRDC partners like Aerospace and uh, MITRE and and others also have uh, a, a real great head start on training that we want to make available broadly to the workforce. Thank you. General Kreider, your perspective, training and workforce, what do we need to be doing? Well, we need a digital workforce as much as we need a digital uh, engineering capability. Um, 
it's the digital workforce that's going to make the digital and uh, the digital trinity come to life. And so from a Space Force perspective, we're going after that as a one of our major lines of effort uh, that's required to be a digital service. Here again, partnering very, very closely with the Air Force and the Department of the Air Force has been a big initiative uh, called Digital University that we have uh, grabbed onto and we're very excited about. Digital University is a way of providing uh, online continuous learning to uh, every member of the Space Force, mil uh, military and civilian, access to uh, modern current uh, coursework in, in a variety of different uh, topic areas to build competencies uh, throughout somebody's career. Uh, and so some of the areas that we are looking to ensure are available through this platform are uh, courses in software development, courses in cybersecurity, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, modern uh, product management, uh, agile techniques, uh, as well as digital engineering. Now, digital engineering as a topic area isn't uh, available uh, at the scale that, that we need it yet through some of these commercial providers. So in fact, we're partnering very closely with uh, our sister service uh, and with the department and with the FFRDC partners that uh, Kristen mentioned uh, to ensure that digital engineering coursework can be made available through the digital engineering platform and continuously refreshed. And then over time, I'm sure that the commercial partners uh, will be looking to integrate these capabilities and uh, making that all accessible and integrated with uh, other uh, online learning that's evolving uh, at the department level through uh, defense acquisition uh, university uh, tie-in as well. That's how we're going to get uh, the digital workforce in place is giving uh, all of our Air Force and Space Force members access to uh, continuous content, online learning, new topics, uh, areas that they can they can learn and dive into and, and increase their level of proficiency from kind of novice basic introductory understanding of the topics and some level of fluency all the way up to high degrees of mastery and proficiency and hands-on. Uh, coding skills, hands-on uh, modeling and integration skills, hands-on data science uh, and analytics uh, available through the different types of programs that this this kind of a venue could could offer to us. We think that that's critical and has to be uh, part of this overall approach to how we evolve as a department into a digital future, how we help both of our services, Air Force and Space Force, uh, really become uh, digital throughout. Uh, because again, it's the workforce that has to be able to apply the tools, the principles, the concepts, uh, and build it into our everyday way of working. And you've got to understand what this means. You've got to talk the talk and walk the walk and get a sense of, okay, how am I going to apply these technologies? How am I going to change my way of working? I'm going to look at this new digital environment that I have available to me and actually uh, take advantage of it uh, and make use of it. We've got to build that into the, the training and education process of everything that we do. So we're really excited uh, in the Space Force. The fact that we're starting out as a new service and can kind of take a clean sheet approach to everything that we do uh, as we stand up our new commands and, and evolve um, you know, Space and Missile Center to Space Systems Command with this digital underpinning that, that goes along with it. Our Space Operations Command uh, standing standing up this past year and its focus on digital operations and tying our operators into that agile DevSecOps process from the start uh, and developing software development skills within operations so that problems can be solved and worked through in this digital environment. And then our newest command uh, that will stand up uh, later uh, this year, hopefully the Space Training and Readiness Command. And it's that command that will be the command that focuses on how do we build those digital competencies into the workforce from the very beginning and throughout across all of our disciplines, uh, operations, acquisition, engineering, uh, and to, to include intelligence and cyber, uh, as well as space operations, all of that fully integrated and tied in. So that's got to be a key piece of it. And we're uh, looking forward to the road ahead to ensure that the workforce uh, has those skill sets that it needs and can take advantage of these capabilities. Thank you. A slightly different question following up on that, this digital fluency that we're talking about in our workforce. Do you think it extends even back further into our secondary education and our education systems that feed into the workforce or develop our workforce? 
what we're finding is our, our, our junior workforce, they're coming out of college with the familiarity of these types of models and tools. And so they're ready. Um, they're much more adaptable than, than, than some of us are who've been here for a while. Um, you know, we all, we're all trying and, and we're, we're doing better, but, but these, the, the, our junior workforce, uh, has a lot that they can offer and they can adapt quickly and, and really be the, the lead of, of the implementers. Thank you. General Kreider. I would definitely second that. There, you know, the, the workforce that's coming in uh, already has a head start uh, on using these kinds of online learning tools. I know uh, for those of, for those of you out there who have uh, children, teenage children, young adults, you know that a lot of the way that they learn is they go on YouTube uh, or they go right into some sort of an online learning environment and they pick up uh, information very quickly and they start applying it. Uh, and and so we see folks very comfortable. Uh, in fact surprised that that's not the way that, you know, you, you can uh, get access to information or, you know, that uh, that we're not doing that as a normal course of action because because that's how they learn. They're very accustomed to it. And they're very used to it. And they're coming in very adept uh, in many of these technologies. But even taking it further back um, and from more of an overall institutional standpoint, I mean, we've seen certainly through uh, our STEM outreach that uh, more and more um, primary and secondary education uh, are emphasizing these kinds of skill sets, this kinds of learning, uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about here, you know, are becoming uh, more critical to all aspects of, of learning and all subject areas. Uh, and so um, the educational system, I think, in our country is quickly evolving. COVID has helped, right? Online learning and tele, uh, telelearning right. uh, has certainly rapidly advanced, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's, it's helped us all, and you know the kids. The kids haven't missed a beat. I mean, sure, they miss a lot of the social interaction, but as far as learning goes and being adept at picking up these new tools and skill sets, uh, you know, it, it's it's moved out very very quickly. Uh, and being very comfortable with these these kinds of digital tools and capabilities, uh, and the importance of software to everything that we do. I mean, everybody's becoming more and more appreciative of the role of software how critical software is, uh, protected and secured software, uh, communication systems and the security associated with that, it's such a critical part of our everyday life. Everybody recognizes that. Uh, and so coming into environments where you're actually leveraging all of that uh, and building that into what you do is not foreign, but we need to continue to uh, foster that, that education and that growth uh, and the ability to, to bring folks in uh, that want to apply those skill sets uh, to the really tough problems that we're facing uh, in our DoD. Thank you. So let's talk about something that you both have touched on a little bit, but is critical to have a digital engineering environment. And General Crowder, you as a former chief data officer, let's talk about the impact or the significance of data and how we view data and what we need to think about in terms of uh, managing, looking at data, how we how we share it, all of those things that make a lot of what we've been talking about even possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, data is a is a critical underpinning that, uh, throughout all of this, uh, and I'm very pleased. You know, having been the Air Force Chief Data Officer uh, when we first got the that office stood up back in 2017, uh, how far we've come in a very short amount of time, uh, and the leadership that. Uh, has, has taken on that, that organization, uh, Ms. Eileen Vadreen and her team working in close partnership with uh, Ms. Lauren Knelsenberger and the CIO at the Air Force, uh, Department of the Air Force level, uh, Ms. Baldwin and her team and others in the SAP AQ. Uh, you know, we've moved a long, long way with regards to the appreciation uh, and ensuring that we have environments, we have standards, we have policy, we have process all focused on how we're going to maximize uh, our use of uh, data and make sure that data is in fact uh, visible, accessible, understandable, linked and trusted. Uh, the vault principles that we like to talk about that are part of the DOD data strategy uh, and certainly uh, started uh, here in the Air Force as, as we've been uh, advancing the cause on how we need to more effectively uh, manage our data. Now, I do want to highlight that you know we can talk all day about 
uh, having data available in cloud-based data environments, Data One, you know, is one of those kind of common enterprise services that we're very focused on building out. But if we don't have good data management, if we're not managing that data, if we don't have metadata repositories where we have a way to store and make accessible and tie in the data about the data, uh, so we know where that data is, where it's coming from, what the authoritative sources for that data, what that data means. Uh, with data dictionaries, how that data is organized and structured with data models, it will not be uh, very usable in the long run. And so having effective data management uh, as part of the overall process uh, is critical. It's not the thing that everybody likes to focus on, but it has to be done. And more and more we see an appreciation for that uh, as we build these kind of capabilities out. It's certainly critical in this digital program, e-program, digital engineering kinds of environment, the whole uh, way in which we are very focused on ensuring that uh, we understand uh, how our models are described. So the data about the models themselves, meta metadata about the models is really critical. Uh, and then the data about the data that infuses and uh, feeds those models is very critical. So as we build these capabilities out, we're, we're building out the data environment and the data management structure to support that. I couldn't be more pleased because we don't want to leave that uh, behind. We can't catch up on that later. We've got to build that out from the beginning because uh, that's what's going to make it much, much easier to share uh, and to reuse if we can understand what these models and what, what the data means uh, as we go. Thank you. Ms. Baldwin, would you like to add on to that? Sure, I'll just uh, pick up on a, a few of the uh, the critical points that Kim made. Um, you know, we we are worried about the the um, validation of the data and the ability of uh, much of our data accesses multiple levels of security, and so we have to have the ability to protect data, but be able to operate at different different levels and have the environments be able to provide that protection. Um, and and uh, and so there's a lot of effort going on right now to, to include um, just responsibility for marking, appropriate marking of the data. And, um, and that all goes into the data, the curation and the update of the data and how can we make sure that we understand access and sharing as well as these different multiple level integrated security environments. So it's all work that's going on and needs to continue to, to go on. Um, and then provisioning of the data, right? Um, you know, we have existing, you know, we, we mentioned cloud, but then there's also, you know, um, for, for when we're doing uh, modeling and simulation or testing and evaluation, the amount of data is massive. You know, today we 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 port that out right on a CD and we drive it down the road and in order to deliver the data, right? Where where we where we have the capability, we have the the uh, you know uh, networks that do have the bandwidth for transit of data. Um, and so I think as we look into the future, we're talking a lot with the, the data office as well as our high performance computing modernization program with cloud providers, with our CIOs to think about what is that vision and that provisioning of the data to all of the constituent workforce that needs to have access um, and what types of access points are needed um, and and when do you need it to be on premises or when when is it okay? to have access through the through the cloud um, and so so we're I think what we see is a hybrid um, you know provisioning strategy going forward but all of that is really being worked out as we understand who needs what data where it's needed and and to what level and the security and then how can we affordably transition and update that um, that provisioning um, I think um, another really exciting opportunity for um, just to step back real quick on training is that those environments also offer, um, as we update the data, those environments actually offer real-time training, immersive environments where we're learning as we go. And so that's, um, that's another thing that we're expanding out. So not just provisioning of the data for um, um, 
uh, for for operation of the uh, development of the capabilities. But I think one thing that Kim mentioned is, you know, the new the next command that's going to be set up is this training is going to have simulations and training. So we're going to be training um, our our our, our warfighters, our users of the equipment, as well as able to use these, hopefully use these same simulators and immersive environments to train our practitioner workforce. So it's kind of a really fantastic opportunity to finally maybe converge on the, you know, the separation of there's the, there's the system and the model of that system. And then there's the simulator of that system. And they're, they're not necessarily the same thing, right? And so this is also really a, a, a tremendous opportunity for that convergence finally. Um, and I think that offers just a lot of additional um, benefits that will, will come our way. So this has been a very robust and energetic discussion about digital engineering. I'd like to know your thoughts, and I'll start with you, Ms. Baldwin, on what are the things that we're missing? What are the next steps? What do you challenge the listeners to do to help us get to the vision that you have talked about, we've talked about in this story here today? I think, um, you know, uh, some of the key challenges are really to... um, uh, balance our programs that are wanting to move out, quite frankly, because we've got some, we've got this, everybody is taking this on. And so we've got programs that are moving out and buying tools and buying support and buying training. Um, and that's all critical. You know, they need to do that in order to make these, make this uh, start start adopting digital practices. We're kind of incentivizing that, but we need to be able to balance that and catch up with the enterprise um, infrastructure and, you know, sort of um, the more affordable way so that we're not doing this program by program. We want to make sure that we can do this consistently across the board. So we are going to need to, you know, we're just challenged by making sure that everybody is communicating and um, sharing and thinking about how to do this from a from a true enterprise perspective. Um, I think another challenge that we're working very hard that um, isn't as easy is uh, resources, right? So um, we are, we are as a headquarters, um, we are uh, taking a look at um, uh, making our leadership aware in this, in this next um, you know, financial and fiscal planning activity. Um, we're, we're, we're talking across our enterprise about, about what is really needed. Um, and we're working with programs to build and, and try to identify resources within their programs and ways in which they can tap into resources to help them on their journey. So everybody will tell you that resources is a challenge and it's something that we all have to work deliberately um, uh, and effectively. Um, I think that another another big challenge that we could use some help in is security. How do we avoid, um, how do we build in the security into the environments and make sure that we're paying attention to not not creating all of our all, or, or gathering all our data in one um, spot and creating a vulnerability. And so security is a, is an aspect uh, that we have to actually absolutely pay attention to. And, you know, we seek uh, inputs um, from the, from the community in this, in this way. Um, in addition to security of the data and the models, we, um, we want to, we're going to struggle with um, uh, validation and verification of the models, you know, for many of our, our systems, you know, as we start a journey, um, they, these models are building as the system builds, and we're going to be wanting to make decisions with these models, and they'll be at different levels of maturity. And so we're going to have to grow our practices of, of, um, of risk-based model uh, verification and, and for what purpose um, is that model certified and make sure that we, we don't introduce barriers uh, where, where we where you know, and instead can, can benefit and learn from the growth of the models as they, as they, um, as they mature. Um, another thing that um, I think we will, we will seek to um, uh, learn from and demonstrate um, uh, and grow our ability is system of systems. So we've talked a lot about um, sort of individual programs, or I have. I've talked about program managers uh, and particular uh, capabilities. But what 
what we really want to be able to do is is be able to model and digitize an entire uh, an entire warfighting capability or a networked capability. It could be uh, JAT C two or our advanced battle uh, management system. You know these systems of systems. And so what we're going to find, I think, very soon, if not already, is that as each of our programs are developing their system models or their digital thread, we've got to make sure that they're able to integrate and balance and do trades across other system models and program digital threads and environments. And so uh, so I think the system of systems modeling is, is um, going to evolve and be very important. Um, so key next steps, where do we go from here? Kind of like what, what, are, what are we tracking on? Our program managers are going to continue to be trailblazers in this, and we are going to continue to learn from them and adapt um, our techniques, our guidance, and react to their needs. Um, we are establishing a new digital engineering office um, in our Air Force Materiel Command that is going to be an enterprise-wide office and, and support Air Force and Space Force-wide. So we are in the process of, of putting some resources and sort of personnel in place to have a more to move from what has been a wonderful, fantastic campaign of a coalition of the willing, if you will, about 900, you know, strong people in our digital engineering campaign that are doing this as their as another uh, part in addition to their day job, you know, we're going to move to a more structured and sort of um, activity that can really be um, providing um, assistance and, and um, response and, and provisioning this journey. Um, we're going to continue to uh, push our training and the, and the awareness and thank you for opportunities like this to share uh, not only our excitement and our passion, but, but um, you know, some details about what's going on. And um, we're going to um, hopefully hold programs accountable to these new digital building codes. Thank you very much, Roz, and thanks to the Aerospace family. Thank you, Ms. Baldwin. We really appreciate it. General Kreider, what should we be doing now? What should we focus on? Where's the challenge? Well, you know, it's really hard to top uh, what Ms. Baldwin said. I think she hit on so many of the things that we really need to be thinking on. She's absolutely right uh, on all of that. Uh, I would say that to piggyback on many of the things that were said, uh, interoperability. To get to that systems of systems kind of a design and approach that uh, Ms. Baldwin was talking about, we have got to partner very closely with industry and we've got to find more ways to have interoperability across the modeling environment uh, that we're putting in place. You know, this kind of model-based systems engineering has been around for a long time. Uh, that, that part of it's not new. Uh, what is new is the enterprise approach by which we're taking this, uh, the community kind of oriented approach, the systems of systems approach that Ms. Baldwin just talked about. Uh, and so we've got to evolve the models, the tool sets uh, to be uh, built around this kind of a new enterprise and interoperable approach. And many of these things started out in kind of individual little environments. They were designed for specific purposes and specific needs. Uh, another challenge associated with that, we've hit on this quite a bit during the talk, but I'll just kind of foot stomp it, is the data sharing, the data interoperability, the data integration, uh, access to the data, provisioning the data, as Ms. Baldwin said, all of that cannot be an afterthought. All of that has to be built in and, and evolved throughout. Uh, and we've got to have a clear focus on that, the resourcing, uh, the expertise that goes around making the, all of that available uh, is a challenge and a challenge that we have to take on. I would say that another challenge, while we have a lot of uh, enthusiasm around this topic and programs that are leading out as Pathfinder programs to do this, it's one thing to build out the environment. It's one thing to you know, kind of say that we're doing the digital trinity and we've got programs that are designed in such a way to apply uh, these kinds of capabilities. It's another thing to actually make it part of how you work. So the whole cultural evolution, uh, really getting in the pool and doing your uh, program reviews, your test reviews, uh, your CDD, you know, capability development, all in this rapid integrated fashion uh, where all day, every day, we can do a program design review with our partners you know, right on the fly. 
and we can dive deep on different design options and think through this uh, you know, with our partners uh, across uh, industry and FFRDC, hand in hand, all integrated, tied in together, actually doing it, right? actually shifting our culture to do it and to try it out and to make it part of how we work. That can't be understated. I mean, it's it's really something that uh, has to be encouraged, and you know, we've got to kind of put put it on the calendar that we are going to start doing our reviews in this environment, this new way, uh, and, and get after you know the culture change that goes along with this. So I, I would say that those are you know some challenges that we really should pay attention to, uh, and make sure that we're uh, that we're leaning in on. I think as far as next steps in the space force. Uh, so we are we're going to continue to down the path of our Pathfinder programs. We actually one of our Pathfinder programs I mentioned is the Patch program. They have uh, a configuration review board and a test readiness review on the calendar this year to start doing uh, the, those kinds of reviews in the digital environment with industry partners, uh, receiving the digital twin. Uh, and actually working through that process. So I'm really proud of them for taking on that cultural piece of it right up front and making sure that that's a part of it. Uh, we are also you know, really encouraged by our ability to scale. I mentioned that, our ability to you know, rapidly try to move this capability out across all of our programs and make it the way in which we will do uh, all of our uh, systems engineering work, tying it back to the overall force design uh, and integration from how we're going to design into the future to prioritizing capabilities to then focusing, you know, building out programs in this digital way in, into our space test environment that's standing up and then out into operations tied into the training and the simulation things that Ms. Baldwin talked about as well as a small service. Uh, we're fortunate that we can kind of take this whole end-to-end -end enterprise digital thread on uh, and leverage everything that's coming out of the Air Force and really start to apply it to our, our overall service set of, uh, of capabilities and ways of operating. So those are some of the things that we have on the horizon. We're really excited to continue to partner uh, with industry. We're excited to continue to partner with uh, FFRDC and the, uh, uh, the S&T community as well as they think about new ways to do this uh, for our critical space systems. Uh, and we really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all uh, to share our thoughts and ideas and, and look forward to your feedback. Thank you both very much, General Kreider. Ms. Baldwin, you've given us a lot to think about in the digital environment world and how we're going to get to a better place in being more collaborative, working with our partners across the enterprise. Looking forward to that being the norm for us and something not something we're evolving to. So thank you once again. And Rebecca, now back to you. A big thank you to our guests for that great discussion. And thank you to our production team, Colleen Stover, James Liggins, and Jordan Bingham. As always, check us out on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show and sign up for our latest news at aerospace.org slash policy. Be sure to check us out on our podcast and share your favorite episodes with your coworkers and friends. We look forward to having you tune into our next episode. And until then, take care. <laughs>